All right, welcome to today's lesson on input and output. So in order for our programs that we're going to make to be a little bit more interesting and user interactive, we need to figure out how to make that user interaction happen. Well, we do this in two ways. Number one, we use what's called a scanner class that we have in the java.util package when we're trying to input from the keyboard or from files. And then we can use the standard system.out methods to output to the monitor. So when we're going to do user input, we have to follow a simple three-step process. Step number one is to first obviously create the scanner object that we're going to use to input our data. Then we can check any input we get from the user for errors to make sure that it's the actual data that we're looking for. Finally, we can then input the data to be used in our program. So let's take a look at the scanner object. The scanner is an object with methods that we can use to gather data from the user. Now when we create the scanner object here, we have to provide it with the location of the input stream as an argument. This could be either a file or it could be the standard system.in, which means we're getting it from the keyboard. Now there are a number of different methods that we can use with the scanner in order to actually access the data. The first one is called nextLine. What this is going to do is return all of the remaining text in the current line uh, before they press the enter key and return it as a string. The next method will return the next token, skipping over any white space. So it will only give one set of characters until the next white space character occurs. And then you have a variety of methods that will return the next token as a specific type of data depending on the method given. So next int will return an integer value, next double will return a double value, and so on through the different primitive data types. Now unfortunately, as we all know, computer users are pretty dumb. So they're often going to make mistakes in the way that they use your program and obviously you don't want your code to crash just because they put in the wrong kind of data. So for example they might put the word 3 instead of the number 3 and this would result in an exception causing the entire program to cache. So this can be avoided by checking to ensure that the data is of the right type before we actually try to access it. And Here's an example of how we would do this. So the first thing I've done is cr I've instantiated my scanner object which I've called in and I've said that this is going to come from the keyboard by making it system.in as the uh, flow. I then create a variable called integer a, and this is going to be used to store the data that I'm actually getting from my user. I've then set up a while loop that is going to run forever, or basically until I have the correct data, at which point I will break out of this loop. Inside this loop, I give them their prompt, sort of telling them to enter an integer. I then check to see if my input stream has a next integer. So is the next thing that the user typed into the key, uh, computer, is that an integer value? If it is, I'm then going to retrieve that piece of data and store it in my variable. The next line of code here is essentially going to consume any other input that was typed in. So for example, the, uh, the actual entry key itself or if they typed in extra words after they gave me a number, it's going to consume that data and instead of storing it somewhere, it's just going to delete it. It's just going to consume it out so that I can uh, be ready for the next time I want to input something else. I then break out of my loop and I'm ready to go on. If however the data that they gave me is not an integer, I'm then going to input whatever they put in as a string so that I can use that data as an informative prompt back to the user telling them that whatever it is that they typed is not an integer. My code would then come back up to the loop where I would tell them to enter an integer again, and I would continue from there. So since I'd have to repeat this code every single time I want to input a number, that would get very cumbersome and make my programs very long. So it becomes convenient to create a class full of static methods that can be used every single time I want to input. And it would look something like this. So here you can see I've got a class that I've called prompt. And inside of this class, I've created a scanner which is static and private and final because I'm not going to modify it and this is going to be used as my input. Now here I'd create a whole bunch of variety of methods for the different types of input I'd have. So in this case I've got a get integer method but I could have one for getting doubles and getting strings and so on. I've also asked the user to provide me with a prompt um, to give me the information. The rest of this code is the same code that you saw in the example we were talking about earlier. Right? So I'm going to continue looping through to see if they can give me an integer or not. And instead of outputting a specific prompt that I created, I can use the prompt that you pass me in the method when you call it. So to see what this would look like, I've created a little program here. So I'm going to ask for a number. 
I say prompt.getInt, so I'm going to run that getInt method directly from the prompt class, and here's the uh, prompt that I'm going to provide. Once they give me a number, I'm going to just output it back to the screen um, with one added to it. So if I run this here, you can see on the bottom down below it says please enter a number, so here's my number 7, and it gives me my output. But I could run this again and not put a number, so if I was to say please enter a number, booyah says, whoa, oh, booyah is not an integer, please enter a number again, so I can keep doing that until I give them a number, and I'm good to go. So now we'll take a look at the second half of this, which was outputting. If you want to output text, you have to use the print and print line methods, or print ln methods. Use the print method if you wish to remain on the same line after you output. If you use the print ln method, you're going to move the cursor to the next line after you've finished outputting whatever it is you've asked to be output. So here's an example of what this would look like. So if I were to do a print, the number 15, followed by a print 12, it prints 15, leaves the cursor there, prints the 12, and leaves the cursor there. If I did the same thing using print ln methods, it prints 15, returns to the next line, prints 12, and now my cursor would be down below. Okay? I can also print things like Boolean values or strings or whatever else. But sometimes it makes us, we may want to actually format our output so it looks a little bit nicer. So we can do this by a number of ways. The first one is to actually include actual spaces in the output to make things look nice. So I can say print, include a little space here, and the next line of code says to print the 86. I have a little space included here so it's not all mashed up together. I could also write the previous line of code in a single line like this, where I say, please enter a mark, include a little space, plus 86. The plus sign here concatenates the two pieces of data together. What it basically does is convert this numerical data into a string and then attaches it to the previous sentence for output. Notice the difference in behavior when numbers are placed before the string versus after the string. So, if I was to say 2 plus 3 is 5, this is actually going to output the number 5 is 5. So this says, does the math for you. If I said 5 is 2 plus 3, it will print these as individual strings. So say 5 is 2, 3. And if I did this one here, 3 plus 3, because it comes first, it would show the number 6, so it would do the math, is, and now I'm going to concatenate, and I'm actually going to do math, because this is not a plus sign, it's another mathematical operate, operator called uh, multiplication. It's going to multiply that out and say 6, so it would be 6 is 6. Another way to control the format of your output is to con use control characters in the output statement. So you can see here, I say hello there, backslash n, backslash t, my name is Bob. That backslash is an escape character that is used to control the format of the statement. Okay? There are a number of different escape characters we have. Backslash n will insert a new line character. Backslash t inserts a tab. So here, we would have hello there, the next line, and then a tab, my name is Bob. Inserting a double quotation, inserting a single quotation, and if I want to actually insert a backslash, I have to say backslash, backslash. And the last way we'll look at controlling our output is by using something called the printf method. This is a, a method found in the print stream class. Okay? This method you, requires you to provide a string before any actual output you're trying to output. And this string is a, a format string, contains information detailing how I want my output to look. So this format string itself is formatted to contain this information here. Everything in square brackets is optional, and the two items at the beginning and the end are required in my format string. So the percent sign here essentially is a symbol that we use to represent a new format item in case I had multiple formats items in a particular piece of output. The flag is a piece of data that can or cannot be included that is going to be used for numerical output. So if I have a minus sign, it's going to left justify my data, right? my numerical data. The default of numerical data is to be right justified, but if I put a minus, it'll be left justified. A plus sign will either output a plus or a minus sign based on the numerical value that's provided. If I use a space, now normally I wouldn't actually include the quotes here, it would just be a space itself. A space will display a minus sign if the number is negative, or a space if the number is positive. The width option specifies the number of characters that have to be included in my output. 
So if I put a number 8 here, for example, my output would be shown in 8 characters. Left justified for strings, right justified for numbers, unless of course I use the minus sign in my flag there. Um, any unused characters, so if I said I want to have 8 characters but my output only had 3 characters, those unused characters are displayed as spaces. Precision, I have to have a dot and then a numerical value here would show me precision. This specifies the number of decimal places in a floating point value. Again, it's optional because it's shown here in, in square brackets. I don't have to include a precision option if I don't want. If I were to be outputting a string, this precision will, instead of giving me the number of decimal places, it will give me the length of a substring to extract from the string and output. The last piece here is the conversion character. This tells me what type of data it is that I'm trying to output. And this is required. So if I put a D, it means I'm using an integer type, byte, short, int, or long. An F means it's a floating point number, a float or double. A C means it's a character, and if I use a capital C here, it will convert my, my uh, character to uppercase. And then S is a string, and again, if I use a capital S, it will be entirely converted into uppercase. So a quick little explanation or example of what this would look like. So if I was to say print f total is, and then put all this here, this first part of this output will be output as normal. And then I've got my format item here, because I've got the percentage sign. It says that I want to output in six places and two decimal places a float. And then the comma here is the float is that I want to put total. This would output like total is dollar sign, and then my output one, two, three, four, five, six decimal places, and two or six pieces of data, and then two decimal places. Another example here of one that's a little bit more tricky. Again, I want to output a double. This time this could be a negative number of eight divided by three, which is 2.666 repeated. I'm just going to output the number this time, because all I have here is my format item. I'm going to say that's going to be plus if it's plus, or minus if it's a negative number. Whoops. And then in eight, de uh, eight spaces, two decimal places, I'm going to just show you my float. So here I've got the two decimal places. I've got four, sorry, five of those places used. One, two, the decimal counts. Three, and the symbol counts. So that's the number of places. And then my remaining three places are placed out in front. So you wouldn't actually see the space here. It would just be sort of shifted three spaces over to give you that output. That's it. That's all we've got for today. We'll see you in class tomorrow where we can practice what we've learned.